All right, we're very excited to have with us this afternoon Honorable James Gertz. He's been ASN RDNA for just over two years. Annual budget of over $100 billion for equipping our sailors and Marines with the best platforms, systems, and technologies. He's been to SNA many times, and he, we're really honored to have him come back today. Um, Secretary Gertz previously served as the Acquisition Executive for U.S. SOCOM. The reason I point this out is because he established a reputation there for providing rapid and affordable acquisition to the warfighter, which is exactly what Bicemo Brown is trying to do with the establishment of our SURF Devron 1. So with all that's going on regarding our ship count, regarding CNO's comments yesterday on balancing current readiness with modernization, we're very honored to host you, sir, and very eager to have what you have to say. Thanks. Awesome. How are we doing, guys? <clears throat> All right. So, uh, spoiler alert, I'm not going to tell you the exact numbers in the force structure assessment. I am not going to tell you how many submarines we're buying next year yet. And, uh, uh, but I will tell you, Green Bay Packers will win the Super Bowl. So, for all of, there we go. Hey, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time kind of up front talking with you because I really want to, uh, you, you guys have been getting splashed by 10,000 awesome briefers and, and I think, you know, all the commandants and the uh, Admiral Kilbys and everybody else here. So what I hope to do kind of in the discussion is put some of that in context where need be. Uh, and quite frankly, if you have questions about where, based on all that, you, you think the Navy is going, kind of have that discussion. Uh, in the Marine Corps uh, as we head there. With a little bit of preface to kind of tell you how I sense things right now and, and where we've come from, at least since uh, I've had the honor of being in the position. So FY18 was a little bit of get uh, all of our big acquisition programs under control uh, and really make sure we had all the targets sorted and start the realignment towards a national defense strategy. At the end of the day, I've got really one job for the Department of the Navy, right? I turn dollars and requirements right, into equipment and services. Uh, and at the end of the day, my job is to figure out with the awesome team we have in the Department of Navy how to do that so we maximize every dollar, right? so we maximize every minute of time we have available, and how we maximize every person that's in the enterprise, whether it's on the government side uh, or in the uh, industrial base, or out there in the fleet, quite frankly. And so the first kind of year was mostly get everything oriented and get that culture back of focusing on delivery. I put up these first four prior these four priorities here. They haven't changed since the minute I walked into the job. Right? I measure everything on are we delivering relevant, effective capability to sailors and marines. We got lots of beautiful processes to get there and we can talk about Middle tier acquisition or OTA contract tools or all sorts of, all those are our tools. But at the end of the day, I measure myself, I measure our team, and are we delivering? There. Now, I say deliver, and then everybody thinks, okay, you're an acquisition guy, all you care is about new sustainment. Or, I mean, new construction. You don't care about anything else. No, deliver is everything from womb to tomb, right? So this last year, We've spent a lot of time getting the front end of the enterprise and the back end of the enterprise where it needs to be. And putting focus on can we get away from what are very transactional ways of doing business. Somebody has a need and then they hand it off to the uh, N9 and then they, they use some requirements, they hand it off to the N8 and then they use some, con you know, some budgeting and then they hand it to us. And then we write a contract and we hand it to industry and then they work. All right, a very transactional enterprise and move it to an integrated enterprise. If we are going to compete and win, we have got to get away from transactional ways of doing business and get fully integrated. And if you've watched what we've done last year, pick a program like Frigate. Very integrated getting away from a transaction of N9 right requirements, throw it over the fence to acquisition, we write an RP, throw it over the fence to industry, integrating all those pieces. We didn't lock down a requirements document until about the time I put the RP out. And we only did that after having a, a robust dialogue and very interactive with industry. And so part of this idea of how are we gonna compete 
It's get away from transactional things and go to fully integrated. Get away from this mindset, if I have an idea, I might do something, I can never talk to industry, otherwise they can never compete in things. Right? Get, get the system, so it's integration between the secretariat acquisition side and the requirement side. It's integration between, you've heard it, Navy and Marine Corps, like I've never seen. It's integration between the acquisition process and industry, right? So what we're really focused on going into the following years, how do we do that now at scale and at speed? Because we've demonstrated success. Everything I know from SOCOM, all that speed is because you have great relationships uh, where everybody brings our best to the table, and it's a fully integrated activity. Uh, closing the books on 19, we did about over $120 billion worth of contracts. Curiously, we did 10% more in contracts with 10% less effort in one year. Anybody in business knows that's not a bad transformation in one year, to do 10% more work with 10% less internal resources to get there. Over 20,000 different industry partners we contracted with. Over 40% of our work was full and open competition. Also a pretty big number when you put aside where we've got big capital investments. Uh, largest amount of money to small business, uh, over $16 billion directly to small business. 18% of every dollar the Navy spent went directly to small business. All right? We, built, we burned down backlog. When I first got here, we had a lot of money from previous years we hadn't spent. We were about 10% ahead in terms of our spend in most of our accounts. Right? What does that mean? Put the money in play for the war fire, right? Through industry. And so, a pretty remarkable uh, switch, getting our agility up creating naval X, creating clusters of activity, going from what could be a six to nine to 12 month uh, contract process for innovative research, you know, where target is 90 days. We were a little bit, maybe I think a couple days past that. Right? Getting all of this waste out of the system, right, so we can operate it at speed and at scale. That's the way we're gonna have to figure out how to compete. Again, getting out of this very transactional mode. Uh, because fundamentally, we've gotta figure out not only how to be good at being, uh, equipping our force, but working together to take out fundamental waste, right, which is costing us uh, opportunity. Uh, we spent a lot of money on readiness. That's great, we have a much more ready force than we have. Now we've gotta figure out how to sustain that and then drive out fundamental cost so we can reduce the cost per unit readiness. So it's not just enough about being ready, if being ready comes at the expense of everything else, you'll have, a ready, you'll have a ready force for tonight that won't be ready for the next fight. So I think, you know, when I look at this, how are we going to do this at scale and with speed, it's a combination of capacity, capability, and availability. And so our challenge, you've heard the CNO speak, if, the, if uh, Secretary Miley were up here, he'd be telling, now how do we balance all those? If we're a, or a, a very ready force, but we have no ability to put next generation capabilities on quickly, that force will be irrelevant at some point. If we put all our money against new capability and ship count and hollow out the force, right? So any, if any one of those products are zero, right, we fail. And so the art is one, getting, getting things in balance, and then two, working across the cost for each one of those, right, through New, new ways of doing business, new relationships, uh, new technology, whatever it is, uh, so that we can rise the tide in all three and not be forced with a draconian trade between one or two or three. Uh, we are more ready, but that came at a price. So we've got to look for ingenious ways to look at achieving that readiness through all sorts of different methods so we can have the dollars to modernize and bring new construction out. We have to figure out how to get new relationships, so the time, the cost, either in time, people or dollars to bring new capabilities onto a ship, right, doesn't force us to make those trades. So what I'm asking our system to do, what I'm asking all of you out here to do is get out of the transactional stovepipe, right, and figure out how do we get 
integrate it at all levels because that's really what's going to allow us to compete at scale. It's easy to do each individual thing. If you look at the Department of the Navy, Navy and Marine Corps, it's quite fascinating. There is not an element I can think of in the Navy and the Marine Corps that isn't in a rapid recapitalization modernization cycle, right? Aircraft carriers, right? Moving to the first class, first new class of aircraft carriers in 50 years. Submarines, strategic deterrence, aviation, amphibious vehicles, ground radars. There is not an element where we don't have them. And the challenge, right? Doing each one of those individually is hard. Doing them all simultaneously, right, is a heck of a lot of fun, right? Because uh, we got an awesome team and we got a really hard problem. And there's no better place to be in the world than having really talented folks working on really hard problems. We are not going to deliver for the nation a national defense strategy just doing the way we did business before a little bit better, right? And, and you know, having very transactional processes that you just um, make a little bit more efficient one or two percent at a time. That's not going to get us here, right? That's where we've all got to uh, work together. Uh, and, the, and the key last element to that is our talent, right? Sometimes in the acquisition world, we get a little target fixated on process, right? If you have really good talent, right, the process kind of doesn't matter. And if you have really bad talent, the process kind of doesn't matter, right? Um, and so working to figure out how to break down those traditional stovepipes, get integrated and leverage our talents, right, is going to be the quintessential thing that will allow us to go at speed and at scale, right? So two things that I'm really focused on for this enterprise is making sure we are operating with the maximum velocity, right, speed in the right direction, and across the entire enterprise from the earliest S&T all the way to sustainment. And getting those, again, it's not an S&T process that does a transaction to an acquisition process that does a transaction to a sustainment process, right? We got to get fully integrated so that we can use technology to buy down sustainment costs, which gives us more dollars that we can put into modernization, for instance. So that's kind of where we're heading. Um, we got a good foundation. We weren't ready to do this two years ago. Right? We, didn't have the, we didn't have the foundational elements in play that are going to allow us to pivot to the scale we needed two years ago, whether that was in the programs we were running or how we were running the programs, uh, or the way we created relationships with industry. We're not all the way there yet, but we are now, in my mind, have the solid foundation we need to deliver on all the great ideas you've heard in the last two days in light of all the great challenges you've heard in the last two days. All right? We do have an issue with, um, you know, the top line and what can we deliver for that. That's going to be a great debate we're going to have within the national system, and that's, that's a good debate to have. As that debate's occurring, we've got to, one, make sure we're all working together to maximize what we're delivering for the resources we have and then maximize our creativity to talk about how, how we would solve the larger problem, build the Navy the nation needs uh, with the resources that are made available. Uh, and again, it's good to have a hard problem with great people working on it. And that's what we have. Um, but it's only going to work if everybody's all in. Whether you're out in the fleet, whether you're in industry, whether you're in academia, whether you're in the acquisition staff, whether you're on the N9 staff, Right? It's all about mission focus, integrating activities. Um, that's what I've seen work. That's what allowed SOCOM to operate at scale. That's allowed in the Navy in the past. It's not like the Navy's never done this. Right? We've done this before. We have to remember how to do it. And maybe we're not going to do it in the exact same way. It's possible if, if we go after it, but only if we keep those two things in mind. So with that as kind of a scene setter, uh, and recognizing I'm between you and a cold beer, uh, or whatever drink you like, I'm uh, I'm happy to entertain questions you may have out there. We have uh, two seats in the chair. We have the mics, and then I've got some rolling in on the iPad here. So, come on, people, be brave. Come on up to the mics, <laughs> and there's our first one. Thanks, Ted Kaser. I'm again with Sayers. 
And my question has to do with, you mentioned in the, uh, in your budget process, you have lots of things that are tied together, different programs that are to contingent upon another program that have milestones that are related <coughs> to another program. In the context this, of this discussion about naval force uh, capacity, how are we going to measure the success of how we are building uh, platforms, uh, uh, equipment, logistics, and show success through the uh, Palm years? Yeah, so I, um, I focus first on capability. Um, and again, what is it the warfighter needs us to help deliver? And, and, you know, everybody loves to solve problems, so we, we tend to sometimes immediately jump to the solution and then try and make it fit the problem, right? Um, amphibious operations would be a great one, right? There's a lots of ways you could go off and solve that, uh, and the Commandant, I think, who was here probably uh, gave you some great perspectives on it. it. I think my job, our job here, is quickly put a full range of options on the table, right? And if we're going to compete, Right, I think um, one of the challenges, we've had a generation where competing was just doing a competitive analysis platform by platform or, you know, can this airplane fly longer than that one or can this missile shoot longer than that one? And that's important, but that's not sufficient in a competitive strategy. Um, and what you're really starting to see now, which is which, um, fascinating to watch and be a part of, and I hope all of you are, are part of it, is rethinking strategy from a competition standpoint, not from a 1v1 or 2v2, right? How do you impose cost on the enemy, right? How do you make, create dilemmas for the enemy? How do you get that enemy to be wasting resources on things that really aren't important, right? And so I think we're trying to graduate the thought process, and that's why this integration, getting away from each program in their own stovepipe or each resource sponsor in their own stovepipe or each industry thing. Because if you're really going to compete, it's about leveraging opportunities. And there's a whole set of opportunities we have in front of us by using better integration of activities. And, you know, Marine Corps and the Navy, in terms of some of this advanced basing, is a primary example. Right, a small group of Marines that can take out a ship is a tremendously cost-imposing strategy right, that isn't necessarily a platform. Now, you got to have the platform to everything to support it. Um, so the, I guess the way I'm thinking of it is we have a whole set of tools. We've got to be able to learn fast, and we've got to be able to quickly operate across our own boundaries. Um, we meet once a month all the PEOs, SISCOM commanders, uh, and all the DASNs in the Navy, literally together once a month. Part of that is sharing what's working who's experimenting with what, and finding opportunities. You know, one opportunity, you know, we had uh, a program we were buying, you know, jet engines for a ship-to-shore connector. It's a very similar engine to what we buy in a V-22. V-22 guys got together and said, well, why don't we just buy it for you? We saved about $300 million, right? And it wasn't, it was, I mean, you get, when I talk about taking fundamental cost out that frees up our competitive strategy, that didn't cost any program money. It wasn't, and so we've got to get, you know, as a, com as a team, figure out how to illuminate the opportunities and then be bold in our ability to go after them. That generates capacity to do things he or she wants. Putting a laser on an LCS, opportunity. That's what, not what we maybe thought of an LCS to do in the first place, nor what we thought of a laser in the first place. We just have that. We have to have the boldness to try that, rapidly iterate on it. Don't spend 15 years figuring out if it's worthwhile or not. Put it in the hands of the user. So when I talk about integration and this kind of maturing of the warfighting development groups, right? They're a piece of glue that has got to create relationships of here's opportunity. Put in the hands of the warfighter, test it quickly. Now the challenge for all of us is we're really good at coming up with great ideas. It's really hard to stop an idea once you start it because we get personally invested in it or we get institutionally invested. So part of great agility isn't just starting things quickly. It's also saying, hey, you know what? Great idea, not the right time, or great idea, we're not ready for it, or great idea, technology's not there, and then we move on. 
Uh, that's a little bit of the culture we've got to grow back, uh, I would say institutionally. Um, and do it at a point where we don't put industry at risk, right? Where we, you know, you put in a billion dollars and we're fickle about, no, we don't want to do that, right? So again, back to that shared responsibility. Okay, one from the audience. With significantly increasing technology costs driven by industry, how does achieving what the CNO called a peer overmatch happen when the Navy is consistently charged more for each technology advancement, foreseeable obsolescence costs, and unforeseen cost overruns? Hmm. So I guess I'm not sure I actually, I mean, I'm not sure I agree with the premise that, that I think where we've got to figure out is, right, back to relationships. If everything's transactional, everything's transactional, right? If we can create business architectures, technical architectures, operational architectures, where things can come in and out relatively quickly with low threshold cost and low regret, Right? So submarine Enterprise is a pretty good example of, of where we're doing that, where Doug Small is trying to go on you know, a digital twin is a great example. Hey, if I, have a, if I have a ship and it's got my certified go-to-war combat system and it has the next one under test and it's got the third one, which is the weird and wacky with a bunch of algorithms that haven't, you know, it may be building the algorithms on the fly. We can achieve that technology speed without putting things at risk. I think that's where we've got to spend the time to operate it. So we've got to have the, all three of those architectures uh, working together. Uh, that's, again, in a transactional world, those don't tend to work well together. It's very, you know, one by one. And then you spend, right, it's a little bit of, you know, playing blackjack versus roulette, right? If all you have is one marble, right, and you're going to spend too much time waiting to put the marble in play, and then once it's on the wheel, you're not going to want to stop it, even if it lands on the wrong number. I'm much more of the, hey, let's have the right architecture. We make a lot of bets, make them quickly. The ones that are good, double down on. The ones that are bad, move on. Uh, I think that's the way to get after that issue. Yes, sir. sir. Uh, Tom Weatherall, General Dynamics, NASCO. You had a meeting today uh, with some of the leadership of uh, uh, Navy Repair, and I wonder if you might be able to share with us some of the results of that and how now uh, maybe you know, we can get a little better at some of this agility and integration to get uh, warships delivered on time, ready for tasking out of uh, availabilities. Yeah, so it's a, uh, and I think the CNO, I'm, you know, I'm sure CNO mentioned that as one of his number one headers. I know the, that's certainly a fleet. So again, back to that equation of capability, capacity, availability. If availability is a very small number, it doesn't matter. You know, you've either got to spend a whole lot of money in capacity to make up for it, right, uh, or, or you're not going to get there. So I, uh, the reference was we just, uh, the vice CNO and I met with CEOs from all the ship repair enterprise. Uh, and my observation was we, we were not, um, when I first got here, looking at that enterprise as an integrated set of programs. We were looking at them as individual availabilities. And we were kind of treating each as its own just in time. And it would be a little bit of akin to, I have uh, you know, 50 apartments. I need to get them all painted. But I'm not going to call the painter until the Friday before I need them on Monday. And I'm not going to tell him how much paint to bring until he gets there. And then I'm going to be shocked that we're going to not maybe get the right painters delivered at the right time. right? Uh, and so what we're really trying to do is look at that entire system. It's a $10 billion plus a year enterprise. right? War fighting, his war fighting capability tonight depends on that enterprise, not the new construction work. And we, we had not necessarily put all the acquisition tools into play and in looking at it as a system approach that we hadn't. We hadn't put data into play. There was a lot of opinions. Uh, there wasn't a lot of data. And so that whole session was how do we work together where we've all got shared interests, right, to enable us to, again, take some fundamental costs out and bring agility out. And it's not cost out. I'm going to spend what it takes to maintain the ships. My worry is what's going to be the opportunity cost as that number continues to climb if we don't find a better way to go after it. And uh, you know, I would say this last six to eight months, I've been pleasantly surprised. You know, Looking at the availability numbers, we were in a 20% number two years ago. We were about 40%. 
ish last year, we're looking at you know 68% on time availability coming this year. That's good. On time availability is the first on time. Now we've got to do it in full and continue to figure out how to not you know how do we take costs out of the system. What we've done on the aviation side is again understand the data, take action, right. Uh, but not stop at just a tactical action. Look at all the strategic pieces in there. And then finally, I think a lot of you may or may not know, you know, I stood up a DASN for sustainment within RDA. There was no advocate for sustainment in the Department of the Navy. I mean, it's somewhat mind-blowing that, you know, the N4, and again, it's not that INL or N4, I mean, they have a piece of it, but there was no advocate on the whole business end of sustainment where we spend a lot of money and a lot of our business, and it's his fight tonight capability. And so the other thing we've done is really kind of, again, this, this year is built the foundation. We built the foundation to look from S&T all the way to sustainment. Now how do we scale it? Because there's a lot of things technology could do right now to help buy down sustainment costs, which then frees up assets to go either sustain more or move into other areas. That's where I'm hoping we can get to. But it is a shared piece. There's another fairly uh, important initiative in the Secretariat right now of looking at supply chain, right? To sustain something is got, involves like, you know, 79 different organizations. On aviation, we looked at the E2 of the number of different funding lines to keep an E2 flying. And it's like, you know, 30 funding lines from 19 different people. So the other piece is what's the C2? So the TICOM commander gets to prioritize what's important and then we can set all the levers to match that. We have, I think, opportunity to do that even better. That's where we're gonna focus some more this year. Okay, let me ask one from the audience here. We've heard uh, <coughs> many times funding the production of the Columbia class submarine is the first and foremost priority. From your perspective, how can surface capabilities be better prioritized in this resource constrained environment? Yeah, so, I, so again, we have, you know, there's a little bit of a national discussion of we have these very generational investments in, in the strategic deterrence, and that is the primary number one priority is to deliver that strategic deterrence. So we're doing everything we can to do that right, do it on schedule, uh, and make sure that we've got the right business model so that doesn't um, become one of these big, giant, overrunning programs, because if it does, it's going to come at the expense of a lot of other other things in the enterprise. Uh, and so I'm, I'm confident we're getting the right focus on that. We've got the right program set up. Now it's just a matter of execution on that side. Uh, but again, I think we've got to look at, um, we've got to be a little careful in this debate about um, um, resources that we don't get too trapped in fixating about what we don't have, right? And that we all work together to maximize the resources we do have. So we could, back to ship repair, we could talk about the money we don't have in the ship repair account, or we can be working together to figure out for the money we have, how do we deliver on the priorities of the commander we're all here to support. And so I would also, again, back to this, get out of transactional pieces and work together. Now, what I found is at the 05 equivalent level, if you get the fleet 05 and the acquisition 05 and the requirements slash resourcing and they're working at they they can solve a bazillion problems and make a, a lot of really good choices um, if we're willing to empower them uh, and so that's the other element get kind of mission command what's the mission we're going after based on what the commander wants and then empower the next level to really do everything we can and so what I'd ask the surface fleet is again get out of your stovepipes wherever you are in the organization, industry, academia, uh, in the fleet, in acquisition, PEO, whatever, figure out how to work together to maximize return on the resources, right? And, and I don't also ascribe that it's, you know, pick cost, schedule, or performance, pick two, right? If we can do it faster, it's always gonna cost us less, right? If we can get rid of processes that aren't adding value, Right, and get fundamental costs out, right? That will allow us to do more. And so wherever you are in the enterprise, you've got to, you know, I tell the government folks, treat the money like it's yours, but not like it's your kid's college fund, <laughs> right? And, uh, and the program manager that can do something for half the money is more important than the program manager who needs twice as much money in their account, right? 
or vice versa. And, and so it's not about doing more for less, it's maximizing our whole return. And that's where I think if you haven't watched where the Navy has really gone in the last year in trying to get this integration, whether it's N9 and the RDA working together, whether it's working closer with the fleet, whether it's trying, that's where we're gonna get the most out of the resources we have. And then we can have a great debate over once we get the most out of the resources, do we need more resources to achieve an objective? That's a great national debate. While we're having that debate, I wanna make sure we're getting the most for the resources we have, right? Every person matters, every dollar matters, every minute matters. Until you get that mindset, back to surface maintenance, two years ago, I don't think we had that mindset. I sense that mindset now, because it was, you know, it was a bunch of, you know, everybody was a victim, we didn't have enough money, or the acquisition didn't deliver something, or it was the wrong contract vehicle, or the ship came in late, and we spent more time assigning blame than, are we gonna get after it? Uh, and that's what I think is really encouraging Again, not just in government channels, with industry. Uh, in fact, driven much by industry. All right? Good afternoon, sir. Uh, Mark Vandroff yep. from Zenetics LLC. Uh, one of the earlier panels was on, uh, mentioned ready, relevant learning, and it got me thinking about uh, the acquisition <laughs> workforce. Um, with the, the Lord coming up with uh, Secretary Lord's memo and talking about looking at the way we we create that acquisition workforce to be able to operate at speed and at mm -hmm. scale and deliver. And you talked about having a great team to solve hard mm -hmm. problems. I, I, I'd be interested in your comments, sir. What are the experiences and skill sets you want in your acquisition professionals, your program managers and other parts, in order to have them be properly prepared to integrate and to deliver at speed and at scale. Yeah, um, I think it goes back to one of my earlier points. Understand commander's intent. Be humble enough to know you may not have all the answers. In fact, you probably don't, so you need to have a great network, whether that's industry partners or academia or tangential, somebody in the service, or some commercial industry that has nothing to do with you but you can learn from, right? And then be bold in action, right? That's where we need to, so we need to get away from a little bit of a, just your pure individual expertise is the only measure of uh, value that's certainly valuable. Um, but our ability to really leverage diversity in all its forms, not diversity in the social kind of gender, um, um, race kind of thing, diversity in how you think, who you think, who do you know, what are your skills, what are your experiences, and, and that as a, that is what you value, and you value those who aren't just like you, right? That's where we're really gonna compete, right? We compete well when we can put ourselves together dynamically, where we have a culture that respects what everybody brings to the table, and you move quickly, right? And yes, there's processes to get there, but it's not about the process, right? Yes, there's promotion opportunities for people, it's not about getting promoted. Right? Yes, there's, you know, favorite contract tool. It's not about the contract tool. Right? So the way to get there isn't to write a bunch of OTAs or to pick a new middle tier acquisition or pick some process, right? Or reorganize. Right? Understand mission focus. Understand commander's intent on what your right and left limits are. Be humble enough to go find people out there that you can learn from and leverage your network with. All right, and then be bold in action. Um, that's what we've got to establish as our collective culture. And that's whether you're in industry, it's whether you're in N9. I mean, I'm really heartened by when I first got, and what was foreign to me when I got to the Navy two years ago was this very standoffish, oh, they're the requirements people. And oh, they're, you know, from SOCOM, it's one big mosh pit. Commander needs this, who's got something to bring to fight, go. Um, the leaders you have now in, in Admiral Kilby, right, or Eric Smith in the Marine Corps, or Mike Moran and our staff, that are really driving that, it's not about you or what organization it's in, it's what's the mission? What's the data tell you? Not what do you feel, what's the data tell you? That's the kind of stuff that really will drive stuff. Again, you don't get 10% more output with 10% less resources, right, by uh, process re-engineering, right? That's by empowering people and getting out there. 
uh, and understanding intent. That's where we've got to, uh, I think, continue to focus. Now, again, you need processes and you need expertise, but it's got to be much more than that. Uh, I would also shout out to industry, right? Very standoff industry relationship when I first got here. Very, again, very transactional. What we've been able to do on these programs, whether it's unmanned systems or frigate, some of the new weapon systems, and scrunch down that distance and remove waste, because all that, that standoff, while preserving integrity in the process, uh, is super powerful. Uh, and industry's been a good partner with that. We need to enable more. Yeah, kind of uh, two questions uh, asking the same thing. Um, what do you believe are primary changes the Navy's leadership could implement to promote speed of uh, technology and weapons to the fleet? And along with that are some of your initiatives like TechBridge and Navalix helping to do that. Uh, so one of the other thing I, uh, I guess noticed coming into the Navy was uh, great pockets of uh, expertise, not well connected. Um, again, I, you know, I don't think, I'm, I'm fairly certain the PEOs and the SISCOM commanders and the SEA were not meeting monthly to share best practices and rapidly speed stuff, right? And so I think, you know, what I'm trying to create is the culture where, again, it's, you don't have to be the have the one with the idea to implement the idea and go put it into practice, right? So the Virginia guys had an idea that, well, we know what a Virginia sub costs. Let's not spend 18 months sending an RFP and then uh, reading, reading the RFP, then negotiate. Let's just say, here's what we think it costs. Uh, electric boat, what do you think? Try that, it failed miserably. Uh, not because it was bad people, it just it was the dynamics and a whole bunch of other things. F-18 guys heard that, says, hey, we're in like lot 72 of F-18. So we could spend six months writing an RFP with the data we all know about the F-18, and then we could hand it to Boeing, and they could spend six months writing a proposal based on the data we had about what a F-18 in lot 47, 72 would cost. Then we come back to us, and we spend six months reconfirming the proposal, had the data that we put in the RFP, right? We just said, hey, we think uh, here's a pretty aggressive price for three year, multi year on F 18, Boeing. We think it's a good deal on both sides. What do you think? Hand them a price? We awarded that in like a month, right? Think of all the manpower on both sides of the company and the government that were involved in that and added absolutely no value. So I think it's our leadership role to create the culture, right, that it's not, hey, you F-18 guys, you know, hey, I value the Virginia guys who came up with that and failed because that enabled the F-18 guys to go steal that, right? The best form of R&D, you've heard me say it before, is rip off and deploy, right? I'm not very smart. I'm a hell of a poacher. I will steal from anybody shamelessly and give them full credit. But if, you're gonna com if we are going to compete on the global scale, we have got to be opportunistic, right? We have got to get a culture that is opportunistic, right? If a technology pops up we weren't expecting, we've got to figure out how to go leverage that. If we have a programming success, we need to figure out how to accelerate it. If the fleet comes up with a new way of doing something, we are got to say, cool, okay, we'll stop that, we're going to go here. So opportunism, right, means you've got great networks, means that you're humble, that your idea hasn't, it has, you know, a great idea doesn't matter where it comes from, and that you're bold and you take action. I'm trying to create at the leadership level that is a culture. I know the fleet is doing the same thing, right? The number one performance thing on all my direct reports, the first thing I rate them on is they have to have a major initiative that's got at least a 50% chance of failing, right? If we say we want to go try something new, and then all I do is rate you on what succeeds, shocker, we're not going to do anything new, right? Now, judgment's incurred and authorized, so like don't pick the law to fail on, right? Or don't pick safety or something, right? But if we don't value that, dare to try, right, the old SAS thing, then we are not going to be relevant in a competition, right? And, but that takes us across the whole enterprise. Because if we go out and try something like put a laser on the LCS and maybe it doesn't work the first time and the TICOM says, oh, you dumb acquisition guys, you know what the hell you're doing, I don't care about you anymore, okay, that's not going to build trust. 
If we put it on there quickly and we create a safety problem that puts his sailors at risk, okay, that's not very good. That erodes trust. So the, the other core principle, trust and respect across these boundaries. Same with the industry. If I say, hey, this is really important to me, will you go try it, you do it, and then I say, hey, no, I was just kidding, right? That doesn't create trust. That's the culture we're trying to do. I just need, again, if you're relying on me to come up with all the great ideas and, and evaluate them, we are in a boatload of trouble, right? We've got to empower our leadership all the way down to leadership at the lowest deck plate level, and we will be amazed what they deliver. We will be shocked at the speed we can transform. Pretty amazing, you know, 10% and 10% in one year, no great process thing, right? Empowerment, enablement, listen to what the commander wants, figure out how to get it to him or her as fast as you can. All right, what else? Sir? So underpinning how we're going to fight in the future is the mm -hmm. Navy tactical grid and integrated combat system. We've been talking about that yep. a lot this, this week. I still can't figure out where, who's got responsibility for delivering that. <coughs> and then when you translate that to the joint environment, who's leading that charge so that we can fight not only as a Navy Marine Corps team or, or a Naval team, but how can we fight as a joint team? Yeah, so I think in the uh, seven stages of transformation, we're at least at the, uh, we've recognized we have a problem, right? Uh, and I think we've all recognized that there's no single golden solution that's going to solve this whole problem. Um, I would say two years ago, we, we didn't have both of those in our mind. Where well, we've got to collectively figure out, uh, and I'm a little, I, my biggest worry in, in solving that very hard, complex problem is going after the Big Bang Theory and spending 10 years to come up with some great system, you know. So I think we've got to find the right balance of what are we doing every day to fill in the chart? So what am I doing to be able to get an F-35 to be able to send a signal to a surface ship and let me figure out how to close that link? And then what am I going to do tomorrow to figure if it's an Army search radar? And so we've got to, I would say, have the right strategic vision but not get paralyzed that it's going to be you know, one big program of record to solve all of it, because I think it's going to be a thousand million little things, because that, otherwise we won't get the speed of parallel activity. Um, you know, we've got to figure out how to work with our allies on this. If we create the bazillion dollar gizmo that, you know, it takes us forever to, to believe we can release it to them, that's not going to work either. So, I mean, the UK has got a very interesting, um, you know, concept you talk to Sea Lord about, I don't want to be interoperable, I want to be interchangeable, right? I want to be able to have a destroyer come in and out of a net as an interchangeable asset, not something I can interoperate. I, you know, and we've done some interesting work, right? US F-35 is landing on the deck of the Queen Elizabeth, completely interchangeable. I was out there launching airplanes. I had to, you know, I did have my decoder ring to figure out is that a US tail, a UK tail? Is it a US pilot in a UK airplane? Um, I think we also have to have some of that mindset because if it's too um, fragile, the biggest thing I worry in that net is having an exquisite capability that's very fragile, right? And so I think we've got a, but it's a hard problem. Now, who's, who's got the lead for it? So I've kind of set up a digital uh, integrated team to try and make sure we're leveraging all the acquisition programs, making that, a, you know, available to Jim. So, I mean, a direct report to me to kind of keep eyes on it. Uh, but we still have work to go there. Conceptually, we have work to go there. Technically, we have work to go there, and then programmatically, how are we going to lay that all in? Uh, work to go, I wouldn't tell you we're, we've got that all solved yet, because it cuts across a bunch of boundaries. And yeah, I think you also have to break the problem up. There's a digital, how to leverage digital in the war fight problem and, and thing to get after. There's a, how do we leverage digital to fix a back office, which has got, you know, tons of opportunities to, you know, have bots doing contract closeout, not humans, so we can put humans on you know, new contract. I mean, there's all sorts of things you do. And then there's this, there's this kind of squishy in the middle stuff, readiness, you know, intel support to war fighting, all the kind of stuff in the middle. We're looking at, and we've kind of assigned, you know, leads for each one of those, because how you solve each kind of, of those pieces is different. I think the art will be how do we integrate them so they don't become competing. Uh, and again, I don't want to kind of go down to JTID's model where we have a, 
you know, a, a document that's this high talking about the interoperability standard and then we create our own cottage industry of how to prove that you meet the standard yet the two things don't work together. Um, we've got to learn lessons from that. Okay. Have time for one more from the floor. Uh, what changes significant in the past two years you've been RDNA are you most happy with, but more important, what challenges are still really frustrating you and how can this audience help? So I think the biggest change, I'll circle all the way back to the beginning, is get out of a transactional mindset and get into an integrated mindset. I look at any acquisition person, you can cock yourself into this weird model where you're combat support and you're the war, you know, you're supporting the warfighter. Hell no, right? Everybody's a warfighter. Acquisition is a tool of war, right? Especially big acquisition that's got everything from technology to sustainment. Um, and so I've been uh, very pleasantly surprised by the speed at which we've been able to shift that mindset. Because uh, that's not, anybody who's been in leadership knows, that's not really easy to do. Uh, and we've done it without going through the big drama of a bunch of organizational change. It's really kind of getting reintegrated uh, and, and valuing that. So I think that's, uh, I think, you know, that helps in a lot of, uh, a lot of cases. And so I think we are better applying our tools and skills to contribute to the fight. Um, where we've got to go is scale and speed, right? And make it not just a, something we had an initiative for, or we had an interesting buzzword for, it just becomes the way business is done in the way we value leadership, in the way we value uh, our own kind of view of the world. Um, and so I think we're making progress. Um, challenges is, again, breaking down these transactional stovepipes, right? Getting industry involved in their ideas in our programs as early as possible, and then throughout the program. So we don't pick one, and then that locks out everybody, and we've got to make one pick forever kind of thing. It is. Uh, exchanging ideas at a speed and scale that we haven't done. Part of what Naval X is trying to do is connect up the Navy. Lots of good pockets at the warfare centers and all that, uh, not terribly well connected, right? Not connected well with industry. The thing that still keeps me up at night is the barrier for somebody with a good idea, whether it's a sailor, marine, academic partner, industry partner, and their ability to get that good idea to somebody who can action it and that person having a bold and humble mindset. That's still the piece that keeps me up at night because we are not gonna compete at win until that is a, again, not a episodic, personality dependent action. That's the way we do business, right? And to do that, I'm gonna need all of your help, right? And I appreciate all you've done for us and will do for us. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, sir.